Hello again, folks. Today we're going to be covering section 8.3. Here's a quick view of the calendar, as always. This video is for Wednesday, uh, June 22nd, more or less to make up for the sin <laughs> of not covering section 8.3 when I should have, but it uh, was uh, actually yesterday. Um, as you can see, I've been kicking the can down the road. It'll be corrected by at least the time of the 29th, so not to worry. Anyhow, I'm going to be covering section A3 just today. Uh, put this aside. The packet that I have for you consists of uh, these pages. Um, I'm going to refer to an older document that you may have already, but uh, this is the new stuff. This is uh, the, basically the graphs of the inverse trigonometric functions sine, cosine, and tangent, respectively, uh, that I swiped from the book. Right. And what's important here are the domains that are included. Um, let's see. Oh, pardon me. These are, I should correct myself. These are the restricted uh, graphs. The actual inverses, which are more or less their reflection um, about the diagonal y equals x, uh, these, these are those graphs. This is the inverse of sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay, so good to have. I made this. This is uh, just when we get to the subject of notation. You may see, especially if you're reading an older textbook, that they just simply refer to the inverse as arc sine or arc cosine or arc tangent, or even um, a and then the, the function, so a sine. Um, and then if you really get into it, the uh, capital A's. All right, which refers to something else uh, that's still an inverse, just it has to do with the restrictions. Anyhow, this is more likely what you'll see, uh, the modern incarnation of these, if you will, and certainly a calculator would be able to uh, provide you results for these as written this way. Okay. Um, this is uh, some of the same information I stole from the book for you. I'm like Robin Hood. <laughs> um, and these are some uh, points from the book that I thought were relevant. All right, so even if you don't see this video, these three points uh, will lead you in the right direction. All right, well, I'm going to pay special attention to this. All right. I'm not sure, I don't remember why I included even odd trick identities, but um, that's something that you should have eventually anyhow even if it isn't A3 per se. Um, but these three things here are definitely relevant to A3. Um, this is the process for solving right triangles uh, from the perspective of section A3, which is you're really looking for angles primarily. Um, and this has to do with composites. Now, one thing that's gonna be very important is to pay attention to the order. Um, whether you have the function on the outside and the inverse on the inside or vice versa, because that determines um, what you're really looking at, whether you're going to get uh, basically uh, a ratio, a regular sort of number, or if you're going to get an actual angle, which is why this is written in uh, radians. Right. Then there's what to do when you're evaluating things in this arrangement. They use the letter F the same here and here because they'd be the same type of uh, trig uh, function, uh, an inverse of itself and its regular form. But then there is the situation where you have um, a different trig function in tandem, right? And yet another situation when it's the, instead of the uh, inverse on the outside, as you see here, the inverse on the inside, all right, what to do. All right, so if you're following along, uh, do print this out. I will uh, try to uh, highlight certain details as we go through it. All right, let me put the projector on. And I'm going to bring back an old diagram I made for you. Just to uh, set us off on the right course. Close this door. Alright, this is a diagram from uh, my recollection is correct. Uh, chapter three, all right, when this, the subject of functions first became relevant. 
seems so dim. I'm sorry. Um, anyhow, in the subject of algebra, we have relations, just to remind you, which is any set of x's and y's. And if you have a little bit stricter a condition, in which case that there are no recurring x's, um, then you have a true function, right? That is to say, every function is a relation, but not the other way. Relations are more general, functions are more specific. And there is even a more specific, more strict condition, which is that you have neither recurring x's nor recu recurring y's, right? And what you're told to do uh, usually is that if you have an actual graph, you may attempt to uh, test the vertical line test or the horizontal line test, right? Which is to say that if you draw a horizontal line, this orientation, or a vertical line, if there is only one intersection per imaginary line that you draw, then everything is fine. One-to-one -one functions are important because one-to-one -one functions can have inverses. If you do not have inverse, uh, they do not pass the horizontal line test in addition to the vertical line test, then you, you are not a one-to-one -one function, right? You don't have that and you can't have an inverse. In the case of periodic functions, which is what we've been dealing with, um, the way around that is to intentionally um, cut off infinity, All right? So, whereas a regular sign looks something like this, I'm going to put it here. It seems dimmer than it normally is. Um, here's our sign graph, right? Under ordinary conditions, uh, something that makes this curve, right? That's one complete cycle, but in theory it could, you know, it's periodic, so it would repeat forward and backward, all right? Um, for the sake of including zero, which is a warm, fuzzy, and familiar number, and easy to use, all right, the, um, the scope, right, uh, of the infinitely stretching wave is chopped, basically, between negative pi and, pardon me, negative pi over two and pi over two. All right, positive, so negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. So you get a nice curve like this, all right? And now you have, uh, although it's just a fragment of uh, the original sine function, because it has been restricted, all right, in terms of its domain, all right, it would pass both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, all right? If you drew any vertical line in here, there'd just be one intersection per vertical line, so therefore, it's definitely a function. And similarly, were you to draw horizontal lines through here, also this one point of intersection per line. So it would pass both of those conditions, as long as it's confined this way, all right? All right. These pictures, again, just to reiterate, all right, are domain-restricted sine, cosine, and then you'll see tangent, all right? The same situation uh, over here is for cosine, all right? Uh, cosines normally we think of if it's starting rather at zero zero at zero one, right? It is intentionally chopped so that it is domain restricted between zero and pi, all right? Why? Because then it is a one to one function, at least this fragment of it, and therefore we can make it inverse. All right. What's going to be important and you might want to highlight is this: the restricted domain is the sine is negative pi over two to pi over two. All right, and for uh, cosine is zero to pi. All right, here is a tangent, All right? In this case, um, you just have to sort of confine it to one complete wave cycle, All right? Because here are the normal asymptotes for a tangent, uh, pi over two and a negative pi over two and pi over two, so negative 90 and positive 90. All right, you're just not gonna include the uh, staying alive curve that is after it or uh, before it. All right, whatever orientation you like, okay? In this case, what might be good to remember is that for a tangent, this would be the interval notation to summarize what is allowable for an, an x value in theory. All right, notice that these are not brackets, these are parentheses is because it means that um, they're a reference point here and here, but they're not included as part of this. It's a boundary. All right. Now, 
being that this is also something that would pass the horizontal line test and the vertical line test, this is also one to one. Therefore, there can be an inverse of this. All right, and that's what you would see here. All right. Here, firstly, is the inverse of sine. All right. um, it's a little hard to see because it's just so narrow a picture. So maybe I should uh, sort of try to um, highlight a little bit. This is the original chunk of sine, what is in blue here. Right? That's original sine, original sin. <laughs> um, and um, this is the inverse of sine. Notice the little uh, notation there. Negative one is uh, something of a superscript. Um, not an exponent, it's just a label. All right? That looks like this. And the orientation is uh, more or less the mirror image of what is in blue. All right? One thing to remember, what's still true about um, functions and their inverses is that they have symmetry when graphed about the diagonal line y equals x, right? which would be what this dashed green line is in the picture. Right? It looks like a mirror image on either side. Right? Essentially what that means um, in, in terms of just the values of x's and values of y's, the domain and the, and the range. All right? The domain and the range swap. Right? So what was in the domain becomes the range for the inverse. What was in the range becomes the domain in the inverse. And that's true in all cases of inverses. All right. Now down below, you'll see um, that for cosine and tangent as well. Right. Here are those graphs respectively. I kind of like the, uh, I'm partial to the, uh, the cosine one. <laughs> Is it kind of looks like a bird, you know, in profile. That's kind of neat, right? All right? But here you see it. Here's the chunk of cosine that was preserved from the full um, wave, All right? well, the normal perspective of it. And here is the actual uh, curve of the inverse. All right. All right. And here again is what would be the mirror, if you can think of it that way. Um, the asymmetry about diagonal y equals zero. Right. Tangent. Um, is tangent right, in its normal orientation, staying alive, like that. Um, and here is the reflection of it. What's being mentioned down here is, again, the alternatives for saying the word inverse is to say arc, whatever it is. So if it's a cosine, it's an arc cosine instead of saying inverse cosine. It's the same difference. All right, instead of saying uh, inverse tangent, you could say arc tangent. Okay. All right. Now, what is true um, is exactly what I just stated. All right. Um, that the domain of the one is the range of the other and vice versa, right? What you wanna to try to uh, train yourself to look for is um, to think about things in terms of uh, the input and the output. You know? The measure of the angle is normally what the domain would be, right? So you'd see a theta of some sort. Now, this textbook has, uses t's instead of theta, I don't know why, but. Um, and the range, which is normally the output, is a ratio, right? So what is a ratio? It's a glorified fraction normally. Now, because we use our calculators, we get a decimal a lot of times, and we don't think of it as being a fraction. But if you have any decimal, you have a fraction, at least if it's not um, an irrational number, right? What is gonna switch when you're dealing with inverses are those two outcomes. All right. When you're dealing with an inverse trig function, what you're going to get 
is instead a ratio, right? Perhaps in decimal form. And the range value, right, would be the actual uh, measure of an angle. So that would be the theta. Just kind of save that in the back of your head for the moment. the thing that I made, um, just to reiterate some points here about notation, I'll be quiet, you right. This is to summarize um, some of the same information, but from a, uh, hopefully a practical standpoint. When you ordinarily have a function, I know you may not think about it um, um, too deeply unnecessarily, you know, but you could read it this way. Instead of simply saying y equals the sine of x, right, which is fine, and in place of the y here, you'd have a theta instead, perhaps. Read it this way, right? x is an angle, which is why I sort of tied this into this to emphasize that point, and I put it in black too, all right? x is an angle whose sine the whole kit and caboodle, um, is a ratio of sides, right? Because this normally refers back to um, a right triangle somehow, all right? Opposite of the angle, all right? Over the hypotenuse, right? In the case of sine. So it is a fraction, a glorified fraction, so to speak, right? That would equal y, all right? Um, not to belabor the point, but again, there would be a theta here normally, an actual angle here, and there would be some ratio here, right? It's just that it's obscure a lot of times. The actual ratio is a decimal, especially if you're using your calculator, right? When, of course, you are creating an inverse, what do you do? You swap the domain, the x's, uh, with the y's. And so the position of these variables would uh, switch, like so, right? In this instance, the way you would read that then is as follows. <coughs> Sorry. Y is an angle whose sine is the ratio of sides equal to x instead. All right. So in theory, um, this is the angle now, all right, and this is the ratio in this position. All right. The thing is about functions is that we don't like to have things written incon inconsistently. All right. So if you were going to just sort of frame this from the perspective of y instead, but still mean that, then you would write it this way. Right. This is still theta. This is still an angle. Right. This is still technically the input, but this has been written from the perspective of y instead. So you would say y equals the arc sine of x. That's still a ratio. Right. And this is, I would say, the favored way of writing it nowadays, at least insofar as your calculator is concerned. Right. Instead of saying arc sine or a sine. Or in some older textbooks, they would make a distinction between a lowercase a and a capital A. Uh, is one is uh, not restricted yet, and the other is. Um, you don't have to worry about that, really. Uh, this is still referring to the same thing, which is why I try to make this as consistent as possible. Blue, blue, purple, all right? All right, why? Because this is the faded way of writing. I like to put things in purple that are uh, most important. Anyhow. When you will have something rigged this way, isolated y, and you're employing an inverse function, note the superscript of negative one, what are you looking for? You're looking for a theta, right? It's just maybe in the wrong place as it, you know, normally, right? And what you're gonna be utilizing is a ratio in order to get that. To this point in the conversation, when we were dealing with, say, uh, some of the material from chapter seven or earlier, what we were trying to arrive at was the ratio. But now, because we can, I think I might have sort of let the cat out of the bag earlier. Um, that is maybe a week or two ago. Um, now what we're doing is looking for the angle a lot, all right? And we're using with inverses in order to accomplish that, right? There are naturally inverses of cosine and tangent. Right, so um, here's how that would unfold. 
and this is how you're going to use it. Right? Here's how that would unfold, and this is how you're going to use it. Okay. Now let me go back to the uh, material that I swiped from the book because I want to highlight the, uh, the key components of that. That would save my space, that's cool. Okay. Take a look at this page for a moment. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in on that. A little too much. Okay. Uh, if you have a highlighter or something and you're following along, uh, do this. All right, firstly, um, uh, just to reiterate basically what I said. All right. Um, go down a bit there. At the tippy top here, I better back this off a little bit. We use basically inverse trigonometric functions so we could solve for angles right, of a right triangle. We're given two sides, given, given a ratio, right, a glorified fraction, we find a theta. Right? And you could use your calculator. There is, in the case of special right triangle relationships, you could do it totally independently of a calculator, and it's a good practice. All right? On your calculator, uh, at least the type that we've anticipated for this course, uh, TI-83 or 84, uh, you're more likely to see uh, this button, right, the sign, uh, it's green, it's not showing up again. Right. Um, sign uh, written with a superscript one, negative one, right. Um, rather than say aux sign or ASIN. I would assume if, you, if you're using some kind of a software, all right, maybe even, I think Google itself actually could probably give you this information if you needed to, um, you might type uh, ASIN or aux sign. Now what's gonna be especially important is the stuff down here. All right. These, because we have chopped up um, the um, the graphs of the original trig function, sine, cosine, and tangent, um, these are what we're allowed to basically uh, have for acceptable inter in intervals. So uh, just be mindful when you're doing your calculations right? uh, because of the nature of the, uh, the graphs having been uh, confined. Right? When you're looking for angles, uh, using sine, all right? This is the acceptable interval, all right? From negative pi over two to pi over two, okay? If you have something beyond that, you may, there's some tricks you may have to pull, all right? All right, if specifically you are looking, you're employing cosine, all right? I should say inverses in this case, for the angle interval that is acceptable, is zero to pi, including zero and including pi. All right. When you get to tangent, if you're using the inverse tangent, um, the acceptable interval is negative 90 to 90. All right. So just kind of save that information once again in the back of your head. All right. Let's do some examples. All right. And I'll turn this off. And let's see, get some light back in here. Suppose um, that you are given sine of five pi over twelve right, is about equal to this decimal. This would have to be rounded because it uh, stretches well beyond these four digits, four or five. And you are asked to write 
right, the inverse, given this information. Right. Remember, right, and this is why I, I was trying to emphasize this point, under normal circumstances, what is the input of the function? All right, this is just a regular sine function. It's an angle, so it's a beta. And what it produces is a ratio. It's just disguised as in the, more or less in the form of a decimal. So if you're going to write an inverse, what are you doing but swapping those two? I'm going to use the squiggle equals again because that's what they have here. All right. What would be the input in the case of the... Um, the inverse function would be what is sitting here, essentially. I hope that that's not out of the frame. And it always ends up being. Okay. It's a weird sort of phenomenon. It starts out and then it slowly drifts downward, I guess, because I have a, I have a foam pad, basically, holding this uh, camera in place. And so it must warm up and get soft and then more or less melt. Anyhow, what is the output here, all right, and the input here, swap. So in the case of an inverse function, you're going to put the decimal 0 0.96593, and then realize that it should give you about equal to this angle, all right, 5 pi over 12. That's the whole point of the exercise, all right? Just to get comfortable with uh, making this switch. Okay. And you can verify this with your calculator if you want. You're gonna find as you're doing any of your problems that uh, you have to toggle a lot between um, degree mode and radian mode, all right? In theory, um, this is uh, 75 degrees. So I'll just uh, uh, sort of practice that really quickly. If you wanted to convert this um, to a number of degrees, perhaps you feel more comfortable not to corrupt your opinion, right? corrupt your perception. Right? This would change as such. 12 goes into 18 roughly, uh, let's see, one time with six left over, and 12 goes into 65 times. So left over five times left over 15 would produce 75 degrees. Right? That means if I have my calculator rigged, to give me solutions in um, in degrees, all right. As long as I have the mode set appropriately, here's the on button. Clear. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna just check it here. I have it in radian mode last, so I'm gonna put it over here. Quit. And now, if I wanted to engage uh, inverse func inverse trig functions, just to verify that this is the correct angle. Um, by using this decimal that it must have been rounded. I'm going to hit second and then the inverse sign here, and it shows up on screen, and then type uh, 0.96593. Right. And just verify that I typed it correctly. Yeah, okay. Uh, being that this is a rounded figure, it might be 74 and change, but we'll see. Okay. No, it's pretty close, right? 75, because it has such a high degree of uh, precision here, <laughs> it's pretty close to 75, so very good. Now suppose you were asked to evaluate um, the inverse sine of this ratio, uh, negative square root of 2 over 2. 
first thing I would do is, although it will be given to you this like, like this as an expression more or less, I would write it in the sort of equation style, which means that this definitely equals something. Bear in mind what I was saying before, all right? This input for an inverse is a ratio. It's a ratio of the sides of a right triangle. Now in this particular case, to add uh, some uh, problem here, I believe that this is um, rationalized so that the, uh, uh, the uh, square root of two is in, not in the denominator. So that's something that will have to be addressed in a moment. But all right, what does this produce? Inverses produce, instead of a ratio of sides as normal trig functions do, they produce an angle. So maybe write it like this instead, all right, just to begin with, all right, to more or less remind yourself. All right. Now, as a side note, um, what does ordinary sine give you? Normally, if you have the sine of theta, this is the relationship of opposite in relation to the angle right, over the hypotenuse. In the context of a uh, a unit circle, all right, we think of this opposite as being a y value, and this hypotenuse as being an r value as the actual radius. All right. Now, this information here, the ratio of the sides of the right triangle, would have to uh, correlate to the y and r somehow. Notice what is uh, going on here. There is, in fact, a negative in the top here, all right? R values, you have to remember, the radius is never negative, all right? It's either Y or X that is negative, all right? If you have something given to you like that, even if they put the negative in the middle here, all right? The radius is never regarded as negative. So what you would try to do, if this is the situation, that it's a negative y, all right, is draw a picture that would uh, basically illustrate where there would be right triangles that have a negative y value. So here is a coordinate plane, 0, 90, 180. I just like degrees so much, which is probably not the best. All right. But um, where would the negative y values be if I drew right triangles? Remember, another thing that would be good to keep to memory is that uh, you always draw right triangles perpendicular to the x-axis. So either down to it or up to it. All right. All right. In this instance, yeah, I'll put this in blue. Um, Negative y values, let's just say, would be uh, something down in the third quadrant, quadrant three, or in theory, quadrant four. All right, this is one, two, three, four, right? So if you can imagine an angle like this, right? there'd be some theta here. Um, this would be a negative y in this case. It would be simultaneously a negative x. Right? and an R value, right? But in theory, even if the angle were just here, this would also be a negative Y value. This would be a positive X in that regard. And this is the R, and here's an angle theta. Right. Um, thing to bear in mind, all right? The conditions that we have to uh, abide by all right. is um, that we, we're we going to ultimately choose between quadrant four to look at further or quadrant three to look at or we'll include both of them if we have something that fits into the proper range. This is the acceptable interval. All right, specifically for sine and cos uh, and inverse sine which is negative pi over two to pi over two. 
right? If I had um, an angle that in theory was red from zero all the way over to here, all right, to quadrant three, that would be bypassing what would be pi over two, positive 90, all right? Because remember, this is positive 90, all right? So if on the other hand, I went clockwise, then yeah, I'll have a negative angle as a result of that, all right? If I went from here, I'll put this perhaps in green, for the sake of contrast. From here to there, this is dead. Yeah, that's dead. If I went from here to here, all right, um, that would technically be in this range. I know that this says 270 here, but that's to read it um, from the normal orientation of counterclockwise, all right? If I went just from here, zero down here, all right, that would be negative 90, all right? So our focus really, all right, is primarily gonna be quadrant four, all right, once I fill in the actual values, all right, rather than that one instead. You have to rule it out a lot of times by drawing, all right? Now, these uh, figures, the square root of two over two, should maybe uh, be familiar to you at this point, all right? What do those figures come from? Well, if you have experience uh, with special right triangle relationships, all right? You know that we have the 30, 60, 90 and we have the 45, 45, 90. So use as references, all right? It's not oriented this per se, it's kind of upside down, but I'm just gonna go with this for the sake of space, all right? Here's the 90 in both cases, all right? And if I fill in the other information, let's just say the 30 is here, and the 60 is here, and in this case, 45 here and 45 here, the normal, uh, proportions of this triangle, regardless of what the radius actually is, would be like so, all right? They would be uh, between 30 and uh, 90, uh, square root of three, one and two, all right? Between uh, either 45 and the 90 would be one, and this would be the square root of two, all right? If you see, basically, the square root of two anywhere in this, all right? And it is in fact one of these two things, either special right triangle 30, 60, 90, or 45, 45, 90. That's the one that you want to include in this picture. All right. So that is also how you would rule out that you're not gonna use this one, you're gonna use this one somehow, all right? You're just gonna apply those figures, um, bearing in mind that you have negative for y, all right? What it does is it clarifies one thing, all right? If this is in fact borrowing the proportions of the 45, 45, 90 triangle, then this angle that would be red from here to here is negative 45 degrees because you're going uh, clockwise, all right? It is nonetheless the 45, 45, 90 triangle, all right? All right? So in this orientation on a circle, all right, on a graph, on a coordinate plane, although it would be one and one, all right, one for the x, it would be positive one for the x, it would be negative one for the y, all right? And the square root of two would be here, all right? Because the, the radius, as I said earlier, the radius is never negative or positive, all right? Now, um, having done all of that, you could say with certitude, what is this angle actually gonna be, all right? It would be, because it's borrowing those proportions, all right? Um, negative 45 degrees, all right, if you prefer degrees, and if you prefer radians, there's a lot of times the solutions are required of you that way, all right, this would be negative pi over 4, all right. all right, this is all done without a calculator, and I'll use a calculator just to verify, 
Now, another thing you could do, all right, um, just to remind yourself is realize that this is a rationalized denominator. which is at this point really more about aesthetics than anything, an etiquette for lack of a better phrase. We don't like radicals in the denominator. You might go like, where's that two coming from? Shouldn't that be over here? No, all right. Um, it actually is coming from this triangle, not this one. Here's why, all right. Um, if you had um, standard sign, of 45 degrees, all right? And you know that it's a y value over an r value, an opposite over a hypotenuse, all right? All right, what you would end up with to begin with, just to verify, opposite of 45, this particular 45 here, read from the corner, all right, of the, of the axis crossing, the intersection there. This would be negative one on top, all right? The denominator would be, in this case, the hypotenuse or the R value, which is the square root of two, all right? All right, there you would end up with a radical in the denominator, which is a, uh, just, we don't like the way it looks at this point. <laughs> it's impractical, it's better without a calculator, right? Because it's an irrational number in the denominator. Um, that's the real reason why we rationalize. Um, but uh, the value of this can be preserved while also changing the appearance of it. That's what rationalizing the denominator does. In a nutshell, it's replicating the square root of two here uh, and here to multiply it by itself, right? Why? Because there's essentially a kind of a cancellation effect in terms of the radical. Uh, what was there um, is the square root of two times itself, so it would be the square root of two squared, which basically is just two then. That's why that's there. And then this is negative square root of two on top, as it's negative one times that. All right, so you see a square root of two, all right? Um, at least assume that it's probably referring to this particular special right triangle relationship, right? I know that there's a positive two there, and you might go, well, isn't it that one? If you see in the case of uh, this one, square root of three as a part of the ratio, it's probably this instead, right? So square root of three is a kind of a red flare, all right, that you're dealing with the 30, 60, 90. Square root of two is a red flare for 45, 45, 90. Okay, there's a lot to assimilate, so let's do a couple of these. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I'll save this information up some space here and it'll be on our merry way. I think I need some light. It's a bit gray out today. Sorry for the darkness. Let us say that you had to evaluate instead um, the cosine, inverse cosine of this ratio instead. Um, Negative square root of three, I'm so predictable, right? <laughs> Over two, right? Again, this is this expression is probably the way that something would be given to you. But get in the habit of talking yourself through the logic. This is an inverse, so what would that have to represent? This is a ratio, all right, of triangle sides, right? One of these two, usually, all right? Not exclusively, but usually. And, um, what does an inverse give you? It gives you an angle, all right? So I would just prefer, personally, I like theta, all right? Um, so, um, again, as a signal, you see square root of three here? You're probably gonna be taking proportions from this ultimately. There are some things you have to be careful of because you're dealing with cosine. You wanna make sure that um, the angle in the acceptable interval for cosine is between zero and pi, 
because of the nature of having confined it in order to pass the uh, horizontal line test to be a one-to-one -one function. Um, so start out by drawing a picture and also reminding yourself of a couple of fun facts. I'm going to put the picture here in the center. All right. And I like to always label it, even if I change it ultimately to uh, radians. All right. All right. 270, 360. That last problem, I really should have uh, kept my promise. Not to digress, but... Uh, I'll show you that now, all right? If in the last problem I had entered the information as it was given to me, all right, into our calculator, and we'll do it again for this one, I would have typed it this way. The inverse sine of the negative square root of two over two should produce 45. I believe this is in degree mode, so there you have negative 45, all right? Um, I wonder if you change the mode to radians, if you can get the same thing ultimately in the style of pi as a fraction. It gives you the decimal equivalent, all right, um, because negative square root of 2 divided by 2 Uh, I'm sorry, I accidentally deleted it. Um, I gotta retype it, forgive me. If you have this in radian mode, all right, rather than in degree mode, you will get this as the decimal, which is correct, except that what it's not telling you is the, that this is the fraction of negative pi over four. Negative pi over four is negative 45 degrees. So you're gonna find that you have to, not to belabor the point, but you're gonna have to toggle between degrees and radians quite often, and there is some things that are good to commit to memory. Like for instance, 45 is pi over four. Anyhow, um, Getting back to this, because I'm going to do the same thing eventually. Remind yourself what is the actual relationship, the normal ratio, the normal relationship of cosine. I put it here. Normally, all right, cosine of an angle is what we're dealing with, and that is the adjacent dimension over the hypotenuse. All right, if we're using Sokotoa, right. In the context of a coordinate axis. All right. Um, what we normally say is that the um, the adjacent is really is standing for x, all right, and the hypotenuse is replaced with an r, so a radius. All right. If this happens to be a negative x, because what that's what's given to us here, all right, um, then we have to consider where are the negative x values in the coordinate plane. All right. The x's that would be negative would be in either quadrant 2 or in quadrant 3 again, right? Because this is what is, would be regarded as negative x in either of those cases. Now, you could have an angle that is measured from 0 to just before 180, right? in which case you'd have a tri right triangle like this, all right? Or you could have one that is measured from 0 past 180 into the third quadrant, because that's also negative x's, given that much information, and you'd have a right triangle like this. Remember, they're always perpendicular to the x-axis, all right? Now, if we're using the dimensions of square root of three and two, all right, we're probably borrowing information in this case, all right, the proportions of the 30, 60, 90 triangle, all right? So the angle in here It is going to be 30 ultimately, whether you're reading it that way or this way. And that would be 60, and that would be 60 there. And here are the 90s. 
That means that the um, negative x value, it's a little bit hard to work it into this drawing, unfortunately. So much stuff in the way. Um, would be negative square root of three, because it's between the 30 dimension and um, uh, the, uh, the 90 degree angle, all right? And this would be one for the y value, all right? positive one, right? And this would be the R value of two, right? In this instance, if you're considering the blue angles using the same proportions, the one thing that would change is that the Y value would be down in the third dimension, so you'd have a, the a third quadrant, so you'd have a negative one here, technically. Right. Right. Now, we have to now consider what is the angle, is the angle in the acceptable interval? Well, zero to pi, in terms of degrees, is zero to 180 degrees, right? Um, so of these two things, which is the one that we're actually gonna be working with? The red triangle, the way I've drawn it in red, because it's in the interval from zero to 180. So we're just gonna focus primarily on quadrant two, all right? And not this one then, we can rule that out. Now you might say, well, um, does that mean that the angle here is 30? All right. Um, if we don't use, uh, as in the last problem, a negative 45, all right, because we can get away with using it between uh, positive 90 and negative 90 earlier, then what we're going to use is basically the, um, the coterminal angle that is here. Um, in other words, what would be, instead of reading this particular angle here, what would be the angle as read from the point of zero to there, to this uh, radius? Right. It would be, from reference angles, Um, it would be the 30 that is here, all right? The reference angle is 30, all right? All right, the um, coterminal angle in theory would be, in this case, um, pi uh, minus that reference angle. I, I gotta rearrange it, I'm sorry. This is the formula that we're normally given for reference angles. I'm going to point to something in a moment, all right? All right, they use a little prime mark, and in the case of your textbook, they may use a lowercase t instead of theta, all right? And the reference angle is something like 30, all right? All right, in this case, we could see that it is actually 30, all right? But what if we were trying to find the original angle in this case. It's an algebraic equation, you just have to sort of manipulate it, right? And replace it perhaps with um, the degree equivalent. So pi is 180. Right. If you basically switched these, all right, algebraically from here to there, all right, the angle that we're gonna write here, and I'll put it in blue perhaps just to be consistent, all right, and this 30 here instead, just arrange it algebraically, it's the difference of 180 minus 30. That's all complicated. So the actual coterminal angle here, all right, would be um, 150, all right? That means that this angle here is 150 degrees, all right? Now, I like degrees personally, but I'll bet that you're probably gonna be expected to have this in radians, so, Convert it to a fraction of a pi, all right, uh, by multiplying by the conversion factor pi over 180. Okay. So, um, if you end up with essentially 
150 pi over 180. Simplify the fraction, get rid of the zeros. It's like dividing by 10 without thinking. Um, a GCF of 15 and 18 would be three, all right? So you can simplify by threes. 15 divided by three would be a five on top. And 18 divided by three would be a six on the bottom. So if you don't say that the angle is 150 degrees specifically, all right, then what you could say is that this is five pi over six. All right, and 150 degrees is fine to be in that uh, interval from zero to 180. So you don't have to use the reference angle of 30. You just needed to figure it out by backtracking from 180, all right? Now here, um, just to prove a point again, if you use, I'm gonna put this in firstly degree mode. Uh, let's see. Inverse cosine of negative square root of three over two. This is set to degree mode, just to verify that this is the correct angle, 150. And if I hit enter, you see it's 150 degrees. All right, all is well. Um, if you had this in radian mode again, all right, it'll give you the decimal equivalent in radians, all right? But uh, you may not recognize that that's what that translates to, 5 pi over 6, the fractional equivalent. Okay. I have to do another. Get rid of some gobbledygook here. Here's one with tangent. All right, you're going to evaluate tangent, the inverse tangent of just simply written as one. All right. Again, you could talk. Get in the habit of talking yourself through it. All right. You got to trust yourself that you can. All right. If this is an inverse, then this input is actually a ratio. All right. So it's a glorified fraction. Dimensions from a right triangle somehow in theory. All right. Um, add to it, all right, what this is going to give you. The output of an inverse function, although it's not written, should be an angle. Okay, so you're ultimately looking for an angle in this case, all right. If you get a ratio of one, all right, of the two special right triangles, provided that is what uh, you are using here, um, either the 30, 60, 90, or the 45, 45, 90. Oops, I should have erased this earlier. The one that would give you a one somehow as an input value here is the 45, 45, 90 again, all right? How come, all right? Um, because there is one example of a ratio from this particular type of special right triangle that would produce a one. That is in the case of tangent. All right? This is square root of three, one and two again. All right? But we're not using that in this case. Why? Because normally, Um, when we're looking at tangent of an angle, what is that? It's the opposite of the angle over the adjacent. Think of Sokotoa, all right? And what that translates to in terms of a coordinate plane is that this is a y value essentially over an x value. Now, 
this is just a positive one that's written here. We have to consider, all right, um, what makes a positive. Either both of the pieces themselves are positive or both of them are negative, all right? What does that mean? In theory, all right, where are the negative x's and negative y's? We might have to look at quadrant three. We're gonna rule it out eventually. Or we're gonna look in quadrant one, all right? How come? Because this is a positive x and a positive y. And this is a negative x and a negative y. And the result would be the same when you divide them either way, positive one overall. All right. So ultimately what's going to decide is what the interval is that we're allowed for in verses. All right. We'll check that in a moment. But let me sort of draw a, a makeshift sort of right triangle. If you measured an angle into quadrant one, okay, uh, it might look like that. If you measured an angle all the way into quadrant three, it might look like that. Right. I already could say with some certitude that this is going to be from here to here, 45, 45, 90, and the same thing here, 45, 45, 90. And in that instance, oh, I couldn't do that again if I joined. Um, this will be, I'll put it in red just for the sake of consistency, a uh, positive one for the x and a positive one for the y and the square root of two. And in this case, a negative one for the x and a negative one for the y and then a square root of two. All right. What is the acceptable interval though? All right. The acceptable interval Uh, for tangent is between negative 90 and positive 90. Okay. And we don't include those because that's why the parentheses is here rather than brackets because those are the asymptotes, right? So, um, judging these, all right, the uh, basically the red triangle and the blue triangle by where they're located, quadrant one and quadrant three, and comparing that to the acceptable interval, we could rule out the blue one. Because the blue one would be, if you follow the uh, increments here along the edge, um, beyond 90, right? We'd be in quadrant three, so you'd have some, some degree that would be, in theory, between 180 degrees and 270, all right? So even though those dimensions would work, all right? We're not. We're going to rule that one out, all right? And instead, our focus is going to be here, all right, on the red one. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, if we're in quadrant one, and these are the dimensions that would have to occur, all right, they would be uh, in respect of this particular forty-five. Opposite of it would be positive one. And in respect of this, uh, again, angle here, 45, it would be adjacent would be positive one, and this would be positive one overall, all right? And that's a 45 degree angle, all right, for the theta, all right? Just remember that you'd probably be uh, inclined to write this in radian form, which means you'd have to convert it to pi radians, okay? 45 is a quarter, of uh, 180. So this reduces to pi over 4. Okay, positive pi over 4. Here's just to verify that it should be positive 45 degrees. Um, the inverse tangent of 1 should produce uh, positive 45. And it does. Very good. Uh, let me turn on my projector again and just uh, point at something. Uh, from the packet. Sorry, 
I was a bit of a delayed reaction by parking there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Complete the thought. All right. All right. Um, if you scroll down to here, here's a good uh, procedure to consider when you're trying to solve for one of the uh, the angle in a right triangle. Turn that off for a minute. And I'll kind of leave the, uh, the rest. Right, too much. Right. Um, this is a bit of a, an ambiguous statement. Solving a right triangle in the normal context, the usual context is to figure out what the dimensions of the sides are. But we're in, we're in section A3 right now, so we're looking for angles primarily. Not exclusively, but primarily. So if you are given a hypotenuse right, and a side length, that would be adjacent to the angle. Remember, we always read angles from this corner, in this case. Um, then you're going to use uh, cosine, right? Because those are what the normal, the inverse cosine, I should say. Those are the dimensions that would be relevant for a cosine, right? Adjacent to the angle over the hypotenuse, right? It's good to know, of course, remember, if you have this committed to memory, Sokotoa, all right, opposite over hypotenuse, sine adjacent over hypotenuse and for tangent um, opposite over adjacent right. they go on to uh, you know elaborate on that point all right if you give in one side of uh, that is the hypotenuse and opposite of the angle, then you would naturally incorporate sine somehow. In this case, it would be an inverse sine because we're looking for the angle. All right, and if you're given the two legs here and here, all right, um, the sides adjacent to the right angle, all right, then you would employ um, tangents. All right, so that's a good uh, summary of what we'll be doing. this off again. Turn this light back on. So hypothetically, if you were given a picture like this, um, solve for theta, you know, the angle given this triangle. with dimensions here of 12 and 9. Right. That's a 12, I swear. Right. And here's the 90. Good uh, illustrator should always put that where it's appropriate. Okay. Anyhow, what you have to decide is, firstly, um, what is actually present here, all right, in respect of the angle theta here. If you're looking at this particular angle, and that would be normally what you are on a coordinate plane, right, if this was part of some picture, um, this angle, uh, pardon me, this dimension given as 9 here would be adjacent to it. Right? And the figure that is apparently across from the 90 degree angle would have to be a hypotenuse. So if those are the two dimensions you're given, what does this most uh, conform to? Um, cosine in this case. All right. So therefore, if cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, all right, and what we instead are looking for the angle, all right, all right, um, then uh, the angle would have to be equal to the inverse cosine of this ratio. Right. The input in this case will be the ratio rather than the um, rather than the angle itself. Right? Rather than find a ratio, we're finding an angle. Right? And that ratio is the input. So basically you would put um, 9 over 12 in here, and you could use your calculator. Right. This is these are not right uh, special right triangle proportions. Right? Again, you don't see uh, either a square root of 2 or a square root of 3 at all. So you're going to use your calculator in this case. All right. um, 
You can have it in degree mode or you can have it in radians. It shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but let's say that you did this. All right, cosine of 9 divided by 12. You may have to round, but uh, if you ended this like so, all right, here you get 41 and change. You know, that's degrees. So theta is about equal to 41 degrees if I'm rounding to a whole degree. Or if you happen to have it in radians, um, 0 0.7... Uh, 227 radians. Right? It's not pi radians because it's actually multiplied by pi to get to that. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, I gotta put my projector back on again. So let me do that. I want to just make sure that it's, it's uh, obvious what you need to be using from this while you're trying your problems. Okay, if you scroll down here, the relevant information, all right, you're going to get problems that are essentially composites. All right. Remember, a composite is when you have a function within a function. Right? And in this case, we're going to have a function and its inverse embedded and such. Right? Here's how it was given to you um, back when it was introduced as a concept. I'm going to zoom in on this for a moment. What you see here for composites, right? the function of the inverse function of x, right? if they are truly inverses, will spit out the input here. But bear in mind, all right, what I was uh, trying to express before, what would be the input in this particular orientation? And I'm going to, again, I encourage you, to, if you're following along, get a marker or highlighter, put a big squiggle through this. Because depending upon the arrangement of inverse inside or inverse outside, that will dictate what you're actually looking for, whether you're looking for a ratio or whether you're looking for the angle, all right? When you have um, an inverse on the inside of the function here, right? What is this input, right? This input is in fact uh, a fraction, right? Right? Normally, you know, a ratio. So something over something, whether it's written like that or not, right? It could be in decimal form, all right? So that means that in theory. What is it going to spit out in this arrangement? Right. Um, well, if this is still true, then you're going to get a fraction here, right? All right, as your outcome. If the inverse is on the outside here, all right, all right, and you have the uh, regular ordinary form of a function as the input of the inverse, all right? Um, under normal circumstances, right, what would this input be? This is an angle, this is theta, right? Okay, and therefore, ultimately, what are you looking for? You're looking for an angle, you're looking for theta, right? So, make that distinction, all right? If you have an inverse and then a function in this arrangement, you're gonna get an angle, all right? If you're going to have an inverse and a function in this arrangement, you're going to get a fraction, even if it's not obvious that it is a fraction. Right? It might be a decimal, but it's the ratio relationships of the triangle. All right? Now, because of that a little caveat in each case, all right, there are certain details here that you want to pay attention to. So again, I'm going to put a little squiggle through this right down there. All right? If in the case where you have, you see, sine in its inverse, cosine in its inverse, tangent in its inverse, where you have the inverses on the inside, basically what's going here, all right? The acceptable range, this is just interval notation in a different style, if you will, all right? These are intervals, 
they're just not written in interval notation, right? Acceptable intervals, right? In this situation, you have this type of a problem. You want to pay attention to this part of the graph, the diagram chart. If you have something where there's the inverse on the outside, all right, um, and these would be the intervals, notice they have pi in it, that makes it a little bit more obvious that it's a degree, you know, uh, an angle, I should say. If you have this arrangement, all right, then you want to pay attention to this chunk of this diagram, all right. Those are the intervals that you're interested in. These are, you see that it's negative one to positive one? That is really a ratio of something over something, all right? All right, and since there are equals here, that's the minimum and the maximum, respectively, whereas this is infinity and negative infinity, all right? And you have negative 90 and positive 90. Here you have zero and 180 degrees, right? These are the acceptable intervals uh, that you have to be aware of, all right? They just didn't write them with brackets and parentheses in this case. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples, and I'll refer back to that. Let's try this one. What if I could uh, fit three of these in here? I may be pushing my luck, but uh, let's see. Um, I try not to erase things because I think that it wastes a lot of time. Um, if you are given the inverse sine of the sine of pi over three, It isn't as, um, they're just simply saying evaluate. It is technically an expression, so that's the appropriate word, all right? But you have to kind of, again, get in the habit of talking yourself through, well, what are they actually asking me, all right? If this is the arrangement, that you have the inverse function on the outside, all right, um, then what you're going to get is an angle, all right? This is going to be some theta as a, the evaluated answer, all right? Now look at what you have in here, all right? If you feel more comfortable, and I tend to, which I feel bad to say, all right, to read this as degrees, know that this is 60 degrees, all right? Whether for the reason that you've actually converted it or you actually uh, memorized that pi over three is 60. Well, it'll be 180 divided by three, so indeed it's 60. What is the acceptable inter interval in this arrangement, all right? The interval that we need to verify that that's allowed right, is, um, maybe I'll just point at it here without turning on the projector again, between negative 90 and positive 90. I'm sorry, I'm holding too much stuff in my hands. Inverse on the outside here, all right, and we're looking at sine specifically. The interval for the inverse sine and the outside of sine is uh, something, the input value that is acceptable for x would be between negative pi over 2, 90 degrees, negative 90 degrees, and positive 90 degrees. Both of them are allowed, the actual figure itself, 90. All right, so um, is uh, 60 between, all right, uh, negative 90 and positive 90? It is, all right? Therefore, you don't have to change anything, and the evaluated answer to this is pi over three itself, all right? It is what it is, all right? That doesn't always happen, of course, and you'll see in the next situation here. 
Uh, let me erase this. Suppose you were asked to evaluate um, the inverse sine of the inverse sine, uh, pardon me, of the, of the sine of 2 pi over 3. Um, if it helps, I mean, you could have uh, pi radians memorized, and I would commend you if you do. Um, but if it helps, convert this to degrees first, right? So if this is 2 times 180, that would be th uh, 360. 360 cut into thirds would be what figure? Uh, let's see. Uh, goes in about once, twice, 120. Right, this is 120 degrees. Uh, which means on a graph, here's zero, here's 90, here's 180, here's 270, here's 360 again. Okay. And we already know the acceptable interval is between positive 90, this is pi over 2, right? And if you're going the other direction, negative 90, this is a stand in for 270, which would be negative pi over 2. Right. Where is 120 in reference to these things? Well, if you're reading from 0, as you should, all right, 120 would be in quadrant 2. That's 120 degrees. All right. In that instance, um, we're going to need a reference angle. Okay. So since we can't a lot, this is not in the normal range. This is the acceptable interval here. For the um, inverse. All right, we need something that in theory would conform to quadrant one instead, right? And in that case, we're going to use a reference angle. All right, there's formulas you may remember from, I want to say it was chapter seven, all right, which look like this in your book, all right? If the angle is in quadrant two, as it is, all right, then you're going to take pi and you're going to subtract the angle. That's the way that it's written in the book, all right? Um, this is the reference angle here, all right? I like theta instead, so I'm going to say theta prime, all right? And I'm going to use the angle that is being given here. So what's 180 minus 120? Right. 60, right? Is 60 in the acceptable range? It is, and it would be in quadrant one. So therefore, all right, the evaluation of this expression using the reference angle that is 60 degrees instead, that fits into the acceptable range, all right, uh, we'll just put it in pi radians because that's what's been given here, all right? What is this? This is pi over 3 again, coincidentally, all right, and that's the answer. Okay. All right. Let's do one for tangents. Um, let's say that you have this instead, um, the inverse tangent of the tangent of 11 pi the, over 9, slightly less familiar figure. Um, 
This is a, a peculiar uh, pi radian equivalent of a degree. All right. Well, let me just say this first. Inverse on the outside, what are we looking for? All right. Ultimately, this is going to be uh, an angle. All right. And again, I just impartial to theta. It could be a T if you like. All right. Or some other letter. All right. um, let's figure out if this is in the acceptable range for tangents. All right. um, according to the reference all right, that we have here, sorry. Um, for tangent, inverse tangent on the outside here, uh, we're again between the asymptotes of negative 90 and positive 90. All right. I would bet, uh, I'm suspicious of that, just judging by the figures, um, that it's uh, probably out of bounds. All right. So we'll just have to arrange for something that would work. All right. The acceptable interval um, would be negative 90 and uh, positive 90. not including those. All right. Let's translate this all right, into uh, the amount of degrees it would be, just because it would be a little bit easier to draw a picture, at least for me. Um, um, if you have is a preliminary step 11 pi over 9 and you're converting it to degrees then the appropriate conversion factor would be oriented with pi uh, on the denominator here it's just to cross cancel when we put 180 up here okay the effect of rigging it this way would cancel out the pi's sparing you having to multiply by the decimal 3.14159 and you could cross cancel 9 uh, with 180 because of the common factor of 9 Right, so this would become a one, that would become a two, and then there's a zero left over. All right, in that event, left over 11 times two would be 22, and 22 with an extra zero would be 220 degrees. All right, which means, uh, in relation to zero to start with, all right, 220 would be somewhere in quadrant three in this case. Um, let's just say that that's 220 here. All right. Does that fit in the interval at all? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. All right. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to look for a reference angle that would fit in there. All right. um, so if you're in quadrant three, and I keep alluding to this without promising, completing that promise, Earlier in the semester, right, um, I gave you this diagram to use as a reference. I'm going to put this down for a moment to find it and then point at it. Quadrant three, you're gonna have to subtract the angle 220 from 180, but I'm trying to think of where I put it. Where is this? Here it is, okay. This is an older diagram that you might have if you printed stuff from chapter seven. All right, All right. Uh, how to calculate reference angles. All right. So if your angle is in quadrant one, then you just stick with it, all right? If your angle is in quadrant two, then you subtract from 180, all right? If your quadrant is, pardon me, your, your figure is in quadrant three, as in our case, um, you're gonna subtract the angle 220, in this case, from 180, all right? And here's what you would do in the case of quadrant four, all right? Subtract uh, 360 minus the angle, okay? And then you'll get the reference angle. Again, your textbook has this preference for the lowercase t with a little prime, that's the reference. All right, and the regular T is the angle that you have, all right? So that's handy, all right? Uh, get my stuff together here. So 
sorry. So what are we going to do? Um, being that we're in quadrant three, we're going to take the advice that the angle that we're looking for, the reference angle, would be the angle that's given, all right, namely this, minus 180. All right. So if this is really 220 minus 180, what angle is that? Um, it should be 40, it looks like, right? Uh, yes, okay. So this is 40 degrees, all right? That's our reference angle, all right? Which would put us in quadrant one instead, all right? And the proportions, all right, because it's a negative and a negative would work with a positive and a positive, right? So we would have this 40 degree angle here and putting us in quadrant one. Right? If you notice the dimensions of this, uh, well, the measurement is 40. That's neither the 45, 45, 90, nor the 30, 60, 90. So we were going to rely on our calculator in this case. All right, if we had to, you know, get the dimensions. All right, but in this case, we're just looking for the angle. So what we're going to do is the angle here, which is going to be 40 degrees, we're going to put in radian form. So we're going to convert this back now to pi radians like so, times the conversion factor of now pi on top and 180 on the bottom. All right. um, it's not going to simplify perfectly, uh, but you get a fraction that looks like so. You're going to have 40 times pi over 180 and pull some tricks. All right, the zeros would cancel if you divided both of them by 10. All right, and then these are even numbers, so you could whittle it down at least by dividing by 2. All right, 4 divided by 2 is 2, and 18 divided by 2 is 9. So this is equal to 2 pi over 9, all right, as the, uh, the angle in radian form, in pi radians. Right. If you wanted the decimal equivalent just to verify with your calculator, I'll show you. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. There you go. Um, here's the verifying degrees. All right, if you had entered this with your calculator, an inverse tangent uh, of the tangent of 220, as it was in degree form, here it is what it would be the equivalent 40. Okay, in the acceptable range. All right, or 2 pi over 90. Uh, 2 pi over 9, I'm sorry. All right, moving along. A couple more of these just to be thorough. All right, um, let me show you this, uh, emphasize this other part of the same diagrams now. that in computer language, right? All right. Um, what is now relevant to us forthcoming is this situation. All right. What if you are going to evaluate something given an inverse function, and then the innermost function here is not the inverse of this per se, all right? In that event, there are these situations we have to consider, all right? All right. If you have... Um, this arrangement of sine and cosine, inverse cosine and regular sine. Right? There's a little formula we can employ. Right? Right? If your input value right, for this angle here is in the range for cosine, right, the innermost input 
um, interval. In this case, it's cosines interval that we're looking at. You could subtract the angle all right, um, from 90. All right. If what you're given is not in the interval of 0 to pi, then you're going to find um, a reference angle first. All right. They say another angle, which looks like they're calling it y. All right, but it's essentially a, a reference angle. Okay. Uh, here's what you would do if you had the situation uh, of cosine. All right. Inverse cosine with regular sine. All right. You could use this formula here. All right. You're going to subtract from 90. And if it's not in the, the interval for sine, all right, then you're going you're to find a reference angle first. Okay. Let's see. Um, we'll do two of these. In fact, I might as well just tell you now. All right. To evaluate a composite that um, these types are the inverse on the outside, All right. inverse outside, All right. here and here, All right. you're paying attention to this part of this uh, reference here. All right. In the event down here, Right, that you have the situation reversed, that you see here. This is when you have the, uh, the inverse on the inside. And in that event, you could talk yourself through it. If you have a function on the outside, you're going to get a ratio in that respect rather than an angle. Right? These, because the inverse is on the outside, you're ultimately getting an angle, but in this case, all right, um, you're going to get the actual fraction, all right? And in those cases, you're going to employ uh, the Pythagorean theorem, all right? Whether you use the Pythagorean identity or standard Pythagorean theorem, it's fine, all right? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I think that is as much information from that as necessary, all right? Just the, the immediate problem you're going to see all right, is uh, pertaining to the, um, the references here, okay? All right, so I'll remind you of that. situation. Um, inverse sine, and then on the inside the g function is cosine, so it's different. 13 pi over 6, yuck. Okay, we'll see. Alright, again, get in the habit, I'm sorry I sound like a broken record, but get in the habit of talking yourself through it. If you have an inverse function on the outside, ultimately how is this going to evaluate? This is going to produce an angle. Now, if you happen to have right, this situation, inverse sine, cosine of x, all right, the interval is dependent upon cosine. So uh, we're having to be in the zero to pi, you know, spectrum. Okay. Yeah, 
Now, let's figure out what the actual angle is. What is this in terms of degrees? Uh, 13 pi over 6. Uh, employing the appropriate conversion factor would be 180 over pi. And it would be a cross cancellation effect for the pi symbols on purpose. And you could also cross simplify the 6 with the 180. 6 divided by itself is 1. 18 divided by 6 is 3 with a 0 left over. And then you have 13 times 3, which is 39. All right. And 39 with an extra zero attached to it is 390 degrees. So this is through one complete rotation. So if you drew a picture immediately after this, well, let's see where we are. All right. If we have normally zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and then this would be at the same point called terminal 360. Um, if we go through the ordinary situation, the normal situation, which is to go counterclockwise, perhaps counterintuitively, um, 390, that would be one whole rotation and then a little bit extra, all right? Because um, 90 would be, instead using 360, uh, would be 360 plus 90, all right? So zero, that would be 15. This would be 450 at this point, all right? So, 390 degrees is between 450 and 360, right? But that's through a, a, you know, one complete rotation and then a little bit extra, right? So, what we want is, in the context here, a co-terminal angle, all right, that is in the acceptable range, all right? We need a co-terminal angle in the acceptable range, the acceptable interval. The interval according to cosine, all right? All right, so um, if you've forgotten, all right, again, I'll just point at this document I gave you a while ago. On the same page as the reference angles is a reference to, no pun there, um, how you would calculate um, a coterminal angle, right, depending upon what you're given. So this is again from chapter seven, all right? If you're looking for just simply a coterminal angle per se, all right, depending upon your angle being uh, a negative, all right, or uh, something greater than 360, which is what we have here, all right, you would keep subtracting by 360 until you're in the range that you want and in the interval that you want. Right? So in this context, what we're going to be doing is subtracting um, 390 that's six, minus 360 to get something in the acceptable range. Let's see. Um, the difference between 390 and 360 is naturally 30 degrees. What a coincidence. All right. So in the, the acceptable range interval of 0 to 180, all right, we would have this 30 degree angle, okay. Right. Since the sine of the inverse, the inverse sine of this, um, is, um, a special right triangle here. I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm getting distracted by birds, so uh, sounds outside. Um, we have a special right triangle relationship here, all right? So being that we do, I'm gonna fill in the uh, proportions that have been brainwashed, right? Is 60. Between 30 and 90, there would be a uh, positive square root of three. Between 60 and 90 would be one, and this would be two, all right? All right, why am I even bothering with that, all right? Because what's going to happen is that in place of what is actually given here, all right, we have concluded that this input angle would be equivalent to just the 30 angle, all right? What is this guts going to produce, all right? This is regular cosine, all right, and a regular input, all right? 
that by itself is going to give me all right a ratio of the triangle sides all right so the cosine um, and I'll expand this here I'm sorry this isn't drawn very well but an expanded view of that the cosine of this angle of 30 all right is adjacent dimension all right square root of 3 over the hypotenuse so that means that if I wanted to, I could rewrite this as the inverse sine of those dimensions that would result here. This is going to be a ratio that this produces first. Yes, the answer is going to be an angle ultimately, but it will be the angle now in respect of sine. All right. Um, so the square root of 3 over 2. All right. You could enter that into your calculator, but being that it has the proportions of the 30, 60, 90, right, triangle, you could figure it out, all right, what the angle would be, all right. Sine um, of theta And in this context of sine, this is opposite angle. Right. And this is the hypotenuse still. We're not uh, talking about 60 a, uh, 30 anymore. All right. The bearing that basically this ratio, which was indeed borrowed from this, all right, given the, the conditions of cosine, all right, um, is going to force us to figure um, to change our perspective in, in the inside of the uh, right triangle. All right, this dimension in respect of sine. All right, if you want to think about it like this, all right, from the ordinary condition, the ordinary perspective, which is that you have square root of three over two. All right, it might be easier to just sort of think about it like that as opposed to this, even though it means the same thing. Um, if this is opposite the sine over hypotenuse, all right, what is opposite in terms of an angle of square root of three, all right? In the same triangle, what would be opposite of this would be the 60, all right? Still using two, all right? All right, that's still the hypotenuse, but now the perspective, because we're dealing with the sine portion of the show rather than the cosine anymore, all right, we're actually referring to this angle, ultimately. All right, which means that the inverse sine of the cosine of this, all right, is actually 60 degrees. What is that in terms of pi, as a fraction of pi? It would be uh, 180 divided by 3, so pi over 3. All right, if you want to verify with your calculator, you can. All right, here is the inverse sine of the cosine of 13, ugh, pi, I'll put 30 in just because I already changed it, pi over 6, I'm sorry, I'm futzing with it here. Cosine of 30. If this is ultimately the way that it works out in the acceptable interval for cosine, then the answer to this should be actually 60 because this is in degree mode. All right, we'll see. And there you have it. Yay. All right. All right I get so happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. As anybody would, right? Especially if you put that much thought into something. I just beware. If you put, um, if I were to enter, you might be going like, why don't I just skip all this crap and then put in um, the original radians, 13 pi over 6. Um, I'm not saying that's impossible, but if you did do that, all right, you're probably going to get a decimal as an answer. And you really need to change the setting to radian mode, 
all right? Because if you don't, you're gonna get something funny, all right? So be careful, all right? Don't try to skip steps if you can help it, all right? Um, now, it's worth uh, taking the time to explain was that there was that little formula, all right, on the same piece of paper. Now, let's see if we could uh, get that to work here, all right? There's a formula that maybe could spare us from having to do this, all right? point to it here rather than just go crazy. Right. If you take a look at this again, all right, and we're looking down here of the situation where we have inverse sine on the outside, regular cosine on the inside. If the input value, which is an angle, right, is in the acceptable range, and we ultimately made it in the acceptable range, yes, it was, you know, 390 degrees, but we got it to be 30, all right? What we could have done instead of reasoning it through, all right, was this. We can say, well, um, subtract the input value of 30 from 90 degrees, all right? And that would indeed produce 60, which is pi over three, so that's cool, all right? In other words, since 30 degrees instead, all right, fits in the spectrum of zero to pi, which is 180, all right, all right. then in this situation of inverse cosine, of, of inverse sine of cosine, all right, we could have went with this, pi over two minus the 30 degree angle, right, which is pi over six, all right, and that ultimately is 90 minus 30, which is 60, which is pi over 3. All right, that's a little bit faster. All right. It's a legitimate shortcut. Anyway. All right, let's do uh, another one. case, look at what you have, all right, I'm going to swap up the, the situation here. If you have the sine on the outside, it's a regular non-inverse uh, on the outside, all right, and then you have cosine inverse on the inside, 4 over 5, all right, let's decide, it's a good habit, all right, what ultimately we would, ar would arise from this, all right. This by itself, all right, maybe I should do this, all right? This being an inverse here is going to produce an angle, right? All right, the inverse cosine of these of this ratio is going to produce an angle of sine, okay? So that means that if we have the sine of an angle, ultimately, that this is going to produce a ratio as an answer. All right, the evaluated answer is going to be a ratio of the sides of a right triangle, All right, somehow. In a situation like this, what we may end up having to incorporate, all right, and that's really what this is alluding to here, um, I, I pointed this out. The situation where you have the inverse on the inside and the regular function on the outside, this is going to involve the Pythagorean theorem, either as the Pythagorean identity or the type that uh, is akin to the, um, the equation of a circle, a unit circle. So you may end up using x squared plus y squared equals r squared, or you could go with the Pythagorean identity, which is the cosine of the angle plus the sine of the angle squared equals one. 
All right, you'll get the same answer either way. So um, let's talk about this first. All right. What is the inside guts here? The inside guts itself is a ratio. All right. So if we were saying, if in the ordinary conditions, the cosine of the angle would be um, adjacent over hypotenuse, in terms of a right triangle, and if this is where the angle actually is, um, adjacent to the angle would be a four here, right? and uh, the hypotenuse would be a five here. It looks a lot like a Pythagorean triple. Um, it's probably three then. We could go ahead and figure that out. All right, using some incarnation of the quadratic formula. Um, let's say that we put in these figures, 4 and 5, into here, all right, and solve for y instead of for x, per se. Um, if you put uh, the hypotenuse here, and what would be technically an x value here, right, that's 16. Ultimately, y would be equal to the square root of 25 minus 16, uh, which is 9. Square root of 9, which means, yes, indeed, that this is 3. Right? Right. The dimension here would end up having to be 3. Now, taking that information into consideration, right? if I now look at this as an outcome that produces an angle, The sign of the angle beta, whatever it is, right? We don't really care what the angle is so much as we care what the ratio will ultimately be, right? That's really the answer that we're after. In this particular situation, we have different trigonometric functions and the inverse is on the inside. All right, we're gonna look for a ratio as an answer, all right? Now, we could use these same dimensions here, all right? In the case of sine, sine of an angle, whatever it would be, that would be opposite over hypotenuse, all right? So what is opposite of this mysterious angle in this scenario is three. And what would be the hypotenuse is still five. So three fifths. Okay. Uh, what I should do just to be a good guy is to verify um, that the proportions of, say, a positive, in this case, three fifths, is in the acceptable um, range for uh, cosine. Okay. If cosine was, and it has to be, a positive four, because it was just a, there was no sign attributed to that. In terms of the coordinate plane, that's a positive x value. Right. So um, positive x is along the axis here.
Now, um, the acceptable range for cosine is, uh, I should say, the acceptable integral, just to be careful, right, is zero to 180. So we could be looking anywhere up here in quadrant one or quadrant two in theory. But if, if I were looking over in quadrant two, then I wouldn't have a positive x. I would have a negative x. So I would have to rule out basically that much of the graph. And my focus would really have to be in quadrant one. And this would have to be in the same quadrant as that, right? Three-fifths would have to be in the same quadrant as four-fifths ratio. So this is good. Okay. All right, it's in the same quadrant. Okay. Is it six o'clock already? Yes. Okay. Two more of these and then I'll stop. All right. The more you do, the more comfortable that anyone gets. So I never feel bad about, you know, um, doing a lot of them, you know. As long as I can fit it in a reasonable amount of time. Not two hours, but I think I can get these in. So, um, here again, evaluate say that you had the sine on the outside of the inverse tangent of this ratio, 7 over 4. Okay. What would this produce if it's an inverse? This would produce an angle right, of theta, which means that you would have sine of theta ultimately, which means that you're looking for a ratio as an answer. Um, again, I, I'm kind of content with this version of Pythagorean anything, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Right. Tangent is normally what relationship, and I know I should be looking at it perhaps like this. Um, it's opposite over adjacent. So, in the context of the coordinate plane, what does that mean? It means y over x, ultimately. Right. So we have the dimensions of a y of 7 and an, uh, an x of 4. You want to draw a triangle at that point. Uh, here's theta, imaginary theta. y, x, and this is equal to 7 and that's 4. We don't know what the r value is. Right. Um, because we're going to be finding a ratio involving sine, we really do need to know what this r is. So we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem and input those values. All right, if you put um, four, say, in place of the uh, x value and seven in place of the y value, you're gonna get 16 and 49, which if you combine them is the square root of, let's see, 15, 65, all right? Um, this is ultimately gonna be, if you take the square root of all squared, you would take the square root of this entire other side as well for the cancellation effect. And this ultimately is the square root of 65, right? which is not something that's going to factor, unfortunately. All right. It's an example of a composite number that if you took the time to factor down, um, you're not going to get a perfect square as some portion of the multiplication that produces this radicand. So you're going to leave it alone. All right. You may have to rationalize this as part of the denominator, but that's no big deal. All right. So at this point, if we're taking the sine of whatever the angle is, and in this case, we're less concerned about that, all right, the sine of this mysterious angle uh, would be equal to uh, opposite over the hypotenuse, all right? Or in the context of x and y, it would be the y value over the r value, all right? The y value you already know is seven, Right? And the hypotenuse are just calculated. So this is a situation where you have a radical in the denominator. So we're going to rationalize 
the denominator. And again, in a nutshell, and insofar as the square root is concerned, the easiest thing, if you don't want to think about it too much, is to multiply by a convenient ratio of one, which given this denominator would be that. All right. The effect is that you're just going to have these two things sitting next to each other, seven times the square root of 65. And the bottom will be the, the inside of the radical, the radicand 65 exposed. All right. so, that's an ugly figure, but that is the answer. <laughs> it's proof. All right. Um, seven times the square root of 65 divided by 65 would produce um, this decimal, 0.868, whatever it is. All right. So if we now wanted to make sure that verify, you enter sine of the inverse tangent of the ratio of 7 over 4. All right, and you should get the same decimal, so let's see. There you have it, same decimal. All right. Okay, one more and I swear I'm going to stop. All right. Six from the sound of the church bell here. Okay. All right. Uh, let's say that we were going to evaluate. Let me get the mark, as it sounds like. Um, the cosine of the inverse sine of this uh, algebraic expression. In this case, you have x over three. Okay. This is a little bit different from the other things because we're not being told. Um, and unfortunately, you don't want to confuse this x that is part of this expression as referring to the dimension of x. It's actually unfortunate that they use that letter. Um, this is an algebraic expression. Right. It is nonetheless a ratio, right? As you can see, there's this line here. Right. It's just a little misleading, unfortunately, because of the letter that they chose. Don't be fooled. That isn't necessarily a, uh, an X dimension. In fact, if it's sine, I would assume it's actually referring to a Y. Um, this might be a good usage of the Pythagorean identity instead of, say, the Pythagorean theorem. Or the circle, uh, the equation of a unit circle uh, incarnation of that instead. Um, so, let's draw a triangle. I, well, you know what? I'm jumping the gun here. Bear in mind, what is an inverse going to give you? This, regardless of its input, this is going to produce an angle. All right, so it's going to make a theta. All right. And then ultimately what we're looking for is the cosine of the angle, even if we don't care specifically what it is, all right, which should produce a ratio itself. So the answer ultimately has to be a ratio rather than an angle. All right, between here and there. All right, let's draw a picture involving some of these guts here. Um, if it was oriented more or less, looks like standard form here, the way I've drawn it, of an angle of theta here, All right. and a right triangle with that. Um, if this were from the perspective of sine of an angle, then we would be talking about the opposite over the hypotenuse. Right. So in relation to the angle, right, opposite of this angle would be the dimension along this edge, right, which in this case is an x apparently. That's why I'm saying that it's unfortunate that they chose that letter, but it's possible because it's an algebraic expression. The radius in this case, uh, or the hypotenuse, would be um, uh, 3. If we were to bother to use um, the Pythagorean theorem, not only would we maybe get confused with this letter here, uh, depending upon which version of it. If you use a, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, all right, maybe that would be better. All right? um, you'll get the same answer either way. Um, 
We're not going to get a, a satisfying answer for this dimension because we don't know what that is. All right. um, so if you want to, maybe, and I'll do this as a side thought, if you want to use this version of Pythagorean theorem, just not to confuse that letter with, say, an X per se, um, we could figure out, well, I'll just call this B, sort of temporarily, B is in bottom. All right, and that would be A is in altitude, all right? Um, you probably can get to the same answer. I'll do it both ways, but I haven't used the Pythagorean identity, <coughs> so I'll do that maybe first. The cosine of theta, in theory, can be taken from the Pythagorean identity, which is just a derived version of the Pythagorean theorem using cosine and sine. You may remember that it is this. It's the cosine squared of the angle, right, plus sine squared of the angle and it would be equal to one, the way that it works out. Okay, we would have to rearrange this algebraically first. All right. I'll put a little bit extra light on, it's getting dark. Does that help? I don't think it works. Uh, I don't think it's improving things. Um, and the way that this would end up rearranged algebraically is that you would subtract sine squared to put it on the opposite side. And so, um, cosine squared of the angle would be equal to 1, that was already there, minus instead, sine squared of the angle. Right? And then you would do what you normally do when you're trying to get rid of something squared, because we want just regular cosine, is form the opposite operation, essentially to that effect, and then do the same thing here. Right? So we're going to subtract from a whole some fraction, basically. From the whole kit and caboodle, namely one, we're going to subtract a chunk, and that balance will be the cosine of the theory. All right. So, what's the sign? Um, and if you, if you get a little bogged down, don't. It's just a notation, all right? The square that is here, you could rewrite it if you feel a little bit more comfortable, and sometimes I do myself. Um, by putting this just sort of on the outside. And it makes it a little bit easy to go, all right, I just gotta in incorporate that fraction that is the sine ratio here, all right, and then square it as an afterthought. We already know what it is, it's x over three, apparently. So in place of this, I would incorporate x over three, all right? Remember that when you do square a fraction, that it's not just the squaring uh, operation it doesn't just affect the top, it would also affect the bottom. And therefore, right, what you end up with is this. Uh, you get one minus x squared over nine, three squared, right? And then for the sake of simplifying, you would try to maybe get a common denominator. So since the denominator here happens to be nine and you would like to try to blend it together somehow, um, we could disguise the number one as a convenient ratio still equal to one, but borrowing that. So if I just made this, pretended for a moment that this was nine over nine, all right, then I could, at least I could mash them together. All right. And then I would get this. I would get nine minus x squared above the line, all right, and nine as the common denominator. At that point, all right, I have a radical that is uh, essentially on top of a glorified fraction. So the quotient rule of radicals says that if it is a convenience for me to do so, I can basically break this up into two chunks. I could make it the top chunk, right, and the bottom chunk. Why? Because perhaps some portion of this, is hopefully the bottom, all right, incorporates a perfect square and the square root of a perfect square is a whole number as an answer. So the radical will basically be dismissed, all right? That does in fact happen in this case if you have the square root of nine. What is the square root of nine? Being that nine is a perfect square, you get three. That means that the answer to this problem is an ugly ratio, all right? But it would be this, 
All right, because we simplified our co cosine, this is just cosine of the angle. Um, it would be the square root of nine minus whatever x is squared over three. And in this case, you can't really use a calculator because you don't know what the actual number is. Now, as an afterthought, um, we really should be uh, considerate of what the acceptable interval is, all right, um, based upon what the innermost function is. So I'm a little short on space, all right. So uh, somewhat reluctantly, what I'll do here is remind you of stuff. If we have the situation of uh, a sign It's not worth mentioning, I'm just debating. I'm sorry. Mm. Let me think about it, I'm sorry. Um, the inverse of sine in any case This is the inverse of sine, right? Has this acceptable range, right, in terms of an angle, right? Uh, which is negative pi over two and pi over two, right? Which is essentially negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees, right? In terms of a unit circle, you really should conform to that, all right? Um, there's no negative that is seen here. Here's zero, this would be positive 90, and this technically, if you went the other way, all right, would be negative 90. It's really 270, right? Um, if this is really a y value, all right, over r, and remember the radius is never negative or positive, all right, then this has to be a positive y value, right? All right, ultimately, which means we're dealing with either quadrant one all right, or um, quadrant two, all right, in theory, because that's where the positive y's are. Right. Um, we want to be in the same quadrant ultimately. You know that when you have a square root, that in theory you could get a positive answer or a negative answer. Alright. If I had a triangle in here, positive y and positive x is what I would have, all right, for whatever the angle actually is. All right. If I had uh, an angle over here incorporating a reference angle, this would still be a positive, would, it, would be a negative. All right. All right. This particular triangle would not be in the interval that would stretch from here to here. All right. What would technically be allowable for sine would be quadrant one and uh, uh, quadrant four, right? right? But the way that these dimensions, given that we have a positive top here, so essentially a positive y, is that we would have to be in the uh, quadrant one quadrant rather than the four, right? And even though this coincidentally would be the positive y value here, it's not in that range, all right? So we can rule that out, all right? Which means what's the x value gotta be? Of the two choices, it would have to be the positive, okay? All right, that's a lot, all right? But we are done with chapter eight. Um, and next uh, class, uh, this video is for Wednesday. Um, Thursday's class, I'm going to cover section 9.1 probably by itself. I'm 
okay? And we'll catch up next week if necessary. All right? All right. Uh, thank you guys for listening. That's two and a quarter hours now. All right, I will see you on Thursday. Be careful out there.